This is K.M. Wyland, and you are listening to the 298th episode of the Helping Writers Become Authors podcast. If you're writing a story right now, and it's hard, then I want you to know you are not alone. Every once in a while, one of my stories will be a breeze to write. Everything will fall into place like magic, and the whole thing will be nothing but fun from start to finish. Every time that happens, I start thinking, woohoo, I've turned some invisible corner, and from now on, my writing will always be fun and easy. But I gotta tell you, it never works out that way. Writing is exhilarating, rewarding, and wonderful, but it's also hard. Every single day, it's hard. For me, for you, for every self-respecting, best-selling author out there. So, when you sit down at your desk this week and golden words don't start pouring off your fingertips, just remember, that's how the process goes for all of us. I'll keep typing if you'll keep typing. The latest post in the video series on my blog is why your characters should never tell the truth until this one important scene. It talks about avoiding on-the-nose dialogue for most of your story, so that you can kill it later on by telling things exactly like they are. To find the post, visit my site at helpingwritersbecomeauthors.com. And now, I hope you enjoy this week's podcast entitled What Every Writer Should Know About Omniscient POV. Writers don't only have to decide which character's point of view the story will be told in, They also have to figure out whether to then share that character's narrative in first person, third person, second person, or, cue ominous rumbling, omniscient POV. The point of view, or POV, in which you tell your story's narrative is arguably the single most important decision you can make about your book. POV will affect every single word choice. It will decide which scenes are included and which are not. It will influence your reader's perception of your characters. It may even dictate the plot itself. I get a lot of emails from authors who are confused about omniscient POV. Most of them are getting slapped on the hand by editors for using it. Some are astonished to learn there even is such a thing, much less that it's frowned upon. Omniscient POVs have a grand tradition going back to the beginnings of literature, and it's no wonder many authors default to omniscient POV since this is the narrative voice in which most of us humans tend to verbally share stories. So what's the problem with the omniscient POV? Why are so many authors confused about it? And why are so many editors delivering digital hand slaps because of it? Omniscient POVs are tricky. I have to admit, I always wince just a little whenever authors tell me they're writing in omniscient. I'll admit this up front. Not a big fan of the technique, if only because there is so much more intimacy to be found in the tighter POVs of first person and deep third person. Furthermore, because omniscient is a POV that has largely fallen into disuse, it can be harder to sell it to agents and editors. However, that isn't to say the omniscient POV can't be wielded effectively. We definitely do still see a book here and there that uses it, usually in the literary genre. But the omniscient POV can be a challenge to get right. Authors often struggle to maintain a consistent omniscient voice and figure out how the omniscient POV differs from random head hopping which dips in and out of multiple characters' tight narratives without warning. Perhaps you're one of those authors who is considering an omniscient POV for your story. Or perhaps you're already wielding an omniscient POV and struggling to understand why you're taking flack for it. Today, we're going to explore what makes the omniscient POV tick and how you can figure out if taking the chance on it is the right choice for your story. But first, just to make sure we're all on the same page, let's start with a quick exploration of the differences between the four major types of POV used in narrative fiction. 
As its name suggests, the omniscient POV is one that tells its story from the perspective of a narrator, usually implicitly the author himself, who knows all and sees all. Narrator is rarely characterized or explained, and readers accept this without ever wondering who is telling the story. This narrative functions on the idea that the author slash narrator already knows how the story will end. He is able to observe the thoughts and motives of the characters, although still within certain limits, as we'll discover in a minute. The omniscient narrative does not tell the story from the perspective of any particular character. Rather, it observes all the events in an unbiased fashion and reports back to the reader. For example, consider this excerpt from Bleak House by Charles Dickens. Who happens to be in the Lord Chancellor's court this murky afternoon, besides the Lord Chancellor, the council in the cause, two or three council who are never in any cause, and the well of solicitors before mentioned? There is the registrar below the judge, in wig and gown, and there are two or three maces, or petty bags, or privy purses, or whatever they may be, in legal court suits. These are all yawning, for no crumb of amusement ever falls from Jarndyce and Jarndyce, the cause at hand, which was squeezed dry years upon years ago. The shorthand writers, the reporters of the court, and the reporters of the newspapers invariably decamp with the rest of the regulars when Jarndyce and Jarndyce comes in. Their places are a blank. Standing on a seat at the side of the hall, the better to peer into the curtained sanctuary is a little mad old woman in a squeezed bonnet who is always in court, from its sitting to its rising, and always expecting some incomprehensible judgment to be given in her favor. The third person POV tells the story in the third person, referring to all the characters with the third person pronouns he and she. Technically, the omniscient POV is also told in third person, but The distinction is that a deep or tight third-person POV restricts itself entirely to the perspective of a single character within any given scene. Usually, the protagonist is the primary narrator. Only details observed by the POV character or knowledge he has personally gleaned or assumed can be shared. That is, if the narrator doesn't know another character's mother died, then the narrative can't share that information with the readers. For example, consider this excerpt from The Way of Shadows by Brent Weeks. Stepping out from the niche he'd been standing on, Azoff looked down the street toward the guild home, a hundred paces away. Maybe he didn't need to go with Blint now. He'd killed Rat. Maybe he could go back and everything would all be all right. Go back to what? I'm still too little to be the guild head. Jalaliel's still dying. Jarl and Doll Girl were still both maimed. There would be no hero's welcome for Azoth. Roth or some other big would take over the guild, and Azoth would be afraid again, as if nothing had happened. In a first-person POV, the protagonist himself is telling the story directly to readers and referring to himself by the first-person pronouns I or me. Like deep third-person, first-person is entirely restricted to the thoughts and observations of the narrator. He can't dip into the thoughts of other characters for the obvious reason that he can't read their minds. Unless, of course, he can. For example, consider this excerpt from The Cat Lady's Secret by Linda W. Yezik. From the bus station to the hospital is a long five blocks, a miserable walk anytime, but especially in the mid-morning heat. My net is too short to use as a staff, so the best I can do is just limp along. The hospital entrance doors slide open. Frigid air from inside blasts out, evaporates the sweat on my face, and feels heaven-sent. People stare as I cross the polished gray floor to the elevator bank, same as they stared while I walked over here. I greet them head-on. I know I'm a sight. Who wouldn't stare at an old woman in a bright green t-shirt and baggy plaid pants? Can't blame them for that. The second person POV is used only rarely. It tells the story using the pronouns you or your to refer to the protagonist. In essence, making the story about the reader. For example, consider If on a Winter's Night a Traveler by Italo Calvino. You are about to begin reading Italo Calvino's new novel, If on a Winter's Night a Traveler. Relax. Concentrate. Dispel 
every other thought. Let the world around you fade. Best to close the door. The TV is always on in the next room. Tell the others right away, no, I don't want to watch TV. Raise your voice. They won't hear you otherwise. I'm reading. I don't want to be disturbed. Maybe they haven't heard you with all that record. Speak louder. Yell. I'm beginning to read Italo Calvino's new novel. Or, if you prefer, don't say anything. Just hope they'll leave you alone. The key to wielding an effective omniscient POV is all about maintaining a uniform narrative voice. The omniscient POV allows you to dip into multiple characters' heads, but you will be acting more as an observer than a reporter. As a result, the omniscient POV is more prone to telling rather than showing, which means it's, ironically, a much less immersive style than deep third person or first person. The omniscient narrator observes the characters and draws in the no conclusions about their thoughts rather than reporting the blow-by-blow, in-the-minute firing of their synapses. An omniscient narrative is sort of like you telling your friend about the plot of a movie you watched. Because you've seen the movie, you know how the story's going to end, and you can make educated guesses about the character's actual thoughts during the story, but you're not in their heads as you're retelling their story. A lot of authors who attempt the omniscient POV get shot down on accusations of head hopping. Head hopping is the common gaffe that occurs when the narrative breaks out of POV and jumps without warning from the perspective of one character into the perspective of another. The key to understanding how omniscient POV differs from head hopping is in our definition of character's thoughts. In a deep POV, every word of the narrative is technically going to be taking place inside the narrator's head, and therefore is part of his thoughts. That's not the case in an omniscient POV. Rather, in an omniscient POV, the narrative is free to observe the mindsets of various characters. What it's not free to do, at the risk of confusing readers, is portray those thoughts in the unique and personal voices of the individual characters. Basically, what that means is that direct thoughts are off-limits, although there will always be the occasional exception to confuse things. But, for example, you might write, Jeb wanted to go home. Sally was happy to stay where she was, but Billy just wanted them to stop arguing. But you wouldn't write, Jeb stared out the windshield. Man, I just want this stupid vacation to end so we can go home. Beside him, Sally studiously flipped through the magazine. I don't care what he says. I'm staying. In the back seat, Billy covered his ears with his hands. Even when they're not fighting, they're fighting. The problem with the omniscient POV, and one of the big reasons editors are no longer so keen on it, is that it's dad-blamed tough to write. As you're learning, this is largely because it's a difficult concept to get our heads around in the first place. This isn't to say editors won't accept it. Audrey Niffenegger's sophomore novel, Her Fearful Symmetry, was omniscient and earned an advance of $5 million in a bidding war between publishing houses, largely on the blockbuster success of her previous book, The First Person, Time Traveler's Wife. What editors will always be looking for in an omniscient POV, or any POV come to that, is an amazing narrative voice. That voice needs to be not just something that serves the story, but something that pops off the page and pulls readers in. That kind of voice can be more difficult to accomplish in an omniscient POV, if only because the narrator's voice is much harder to define. So, do you still feel the omniscient POV is the right choice for your story? The best way to learn how to write powerful omniscient POVs is by reading masters. Dostoevsky's brother's Karamazov comes to mind. Read omniscient POVs like crazy and take apart the narratives until you get a feel for how they work and how you might apply them in your story. Thank you for listening to the Wordplay Podcast. To read a transcript of this episode, you can visit my website at helpingwritersbecomeauthors.com. And be sure to check back again next week.